Good morning to you all. Welcome to St. Helens Online Church. We thank God so much for keeping us through this week and for bringing us together in this time of fellowship. We fellowship as we sing, pray, and listen to God's way together. Today we are looking at James 3, and one of the things James shows us is that we all have double tongue. With it we bless, and with it we curse. But it shouldn't be so, should it? Our opening song is going to encourage us to bless, to bless the Lord for all the 10,000 reasons our hearts could find. Please join in as we sing together our first song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord bless the lord my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your rich in love. And you're slow to anger Your name is great And your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons For my heart to find Oh, bless the Lord of my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore bless the lord soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name yes i'll worship your holy Yes, I'll worship your holy name. There are so many things to give thanks for, to praise God for, and to rejoice over. Yet we often get stuck by our worries and as a result fail to be thankful to God. 
let us please use this moment to say sorry to God and to ask him to forgive us our sins. Let's confess together the words of the confession which should appear on the screen shortly. Together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And now here is the word of assurance from 1 John 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Again in 1 John 2, it says, If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Next, Thompson is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Then we will sing our next song, after which Zani will read our passage and Joe will bring God's word to us. Brothers and sisters, please join me as we come to our Heavenly Father together in prayer. Father God, we want to say thank you. In what feels like troubling, turbulent times, we want to make time to come to you and to give thanks for all that we have. We are taking a moment now to be still and to focus on you. Firstly, we give thanks for our lives, our health and the gifts and skills you have given us. Thank you for our friends, family, colleagues, neighbours and for the community you have placed us in. Thank you for all the people who have cared for us over our lifetimes. We give praise and thanks for the many systems of organisation here in the UK that care for us in different ways. We name in gratitude the following systems. The NHS and all health care. Education, welfare, benefits and pensions. Long-term care for the elderly and disabled. Housing, transport, water and energy. Democratic elections laws to protect and food distribution. Thank you Lord for all the people who have shown kindness and goodness to us over our lifetimes. Father by your Holy Spirit fill us with love and joy as we meditate on the memory of your past provision and goodness to us. We ask that this love and joy fill our hearts and that it would flow from our mouths in words of gratitude and praise to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we need to say sorry. Our voices have been used for wrong and our words have been weapons. We have grumbled and moaned when we should have shown faithfulness, remembering that we are placed inside your circle of protection. Father, sorry for the times we have lacked self-control and we have been quick to anger quick to speak but have failed to listen. When we chose to take our problems to those around us but failed to come to you first in prayer and to lament to you Lord, we're sorry. Thank you Lord for all the people who have bared with us over our lifetimes when we have sinned against others. Father by your Holy Spirit fill us with peace as we meditate on the fact that Jesus died to take away all of our sins and that through him we have not only a new future but a new past. Fill our hearts with gentleness, patience and self-control so that this would be witnessed by others in the way we listen, speak and act. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we come to you with our needs. Help us to understand and obey the coronavirus rules and help us to know what the right thing is to keep ourselves and others safe. We ask for your guidance, particularly on how we, as a church family, should meet in your name and what safe corporate worship and praise should look like and how this should be organised and communicated in our church family. Father, we pray for those who are affected by inequality. We ask for your guidance as to how St Helens as an organisation should respond and what our role is to play in our public testimony and action. We particularly ask that you guard against a turning back from what has been revealed on a global scale about racial inequality. Please, Father, don't let those in authority pretend they have not seen and heard. Help them to remember the support they voiced so that we might see real change. Father, we pray for all those who are unemployed or who are struggling economically or emotionally from the pandemic in some way. We need wisdom, Lord, to know how and where St Helens as an organisation and us as individuals can and should respond. If we see or hear of need, please help us to see your signs and to understand that you may be connecting a brother or sister in need with someone who has the time or surplus resources to assist. We are simple selfish humans, Lord. We want to help, but often we don't see the opportunity and our culture makes sharing and giving so alien that we can feel uncomfortable or even embarrassed about offering or accepting any type of help. Lord, please protect us from this individualism and from inaction. Help those who can give to offer and those in need to accept, so that both may bring you glory, living as one body, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Today's reading is James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed, and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago I was driving alone, listening to some of my favourite Christian music, joining in with the words, genuinely praising God, real emotion. And then a car sped up on my left hand side, pulled into my lane and I was forced to brake. And immediately I found these aggressive words spilling out of my mouth. I'd gone from praise to put down in naught to 30. Now, you might be inclined to give me the benefit of the doubt, say, Joe, that's just a driving thing. But it's not. Because I've been hyper aware of my words this week as I've prepared to preach from this passage. And time and again I've caught myself saying critical things. Harsh things. I haven't had to, to try, they just come out. My speech is inconsistent. In, in some way I'm not totally in control of what I say. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Uh, we all experience some sort of tongue trouble. So, so maybe it's with a, a colleague at work. After that Zoom meeting, we, we complain about them because we just find them hard. Or maybe uh, we find that when we're with them, we, without realising it, start making jabs disguised as jokes. Or maybe it's with someone at church, uh, someone who didn't thank us or someone who changed what we did without asking. We, we don't want to, but we, we vent to, to close friends 
and we find that when we see them making mistakes, our inner monologue is just criticising. Whether it's like that, or with close family, people that we love the most, we all say things that hurt others. And we don't have to try, they just come pouring out of us. What do those words reveal about us? Where do they come from? And can we really change how we speak? Well, God speaks into those questions in our passage today, because uh, James wrote to warn Christians against settling for a double-minded, self-deceptive faith. And instead, back in chapter 1, verse 4, he calls Christians to become complete, to have an all-the-way-through faith that listens to what God says and then goes and does it. And in chapter 1, verse 26, James highlighted that tongue control is a key part of that all the way through faith. So in our passage, James sort of turns to us and says, we need to talk about our talk. He starts by saying that not many believers should become teachers. Because a teacher in the church, a leader, is always using their words. Their words are their tools. So if they misuse their words, if they're bullying or, or hypocritical, then that's going to cause lasting damage. That's going to cause public damage to the church. And they'll be liable for stricter judgment. But then James uses a tongue test that applies to every Christian, whether they want to be a, a leader or not. Verse 2. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. The person with the perfect or complete all the way through faith, the kind of faith that James wants every Christian to have, is the person who controls their tongue. But when we apply that test to ourselves, we're forced to admit that we've got tongue trouble. Because our speech is out of control. That's James's first point in verses 2 to 8. Because verse 2 claims that if we did control our speech, then we control what we do. Now, what direction that we take in life. That's the point that he makes with two pictures in verses 3 and 4. A mighty horse can be turned just by putting a bit in its mouth. And even a ship, when it's battered by strong winds, can be turned with a small rudder directed wherever the pilot wants it to go. Now, if you looked at those two huge things, a, a horse uh, or a ship, uh, with the eyes of a child, as if you were seeing them for the first time, I don't think you'd ever imagine that controlling their smallest part would allow you to direct where they go. But that is how it works. And in the same way, verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, but makes great boasts. Our words are much more powerful than we think. We can't make any plan, start any relationship, do anything with anyone without first expressing ourselves in words. Whether those words are internal or external, if we control our words, then we could set the direction of our life. But the reality is that our speech is out of control. It's an uncontrollable force. Verse 6, the tongue is a fire. Like a small spark in the Australian outback, it, it just gets out of control, wreaking havoc in ways that we just couldn't predict, in ways that we just can't restrain. If you think of any past situation where you've gotten into trouble, somewhere your words would have played a part. Because our tongue is a world of evil. James uses the word world to describe the anti-God, me-first instinct that we find everywhere in human society. But he's saying, guys, the problem isn't just out there. The problem's inside. Our own words express that anti-God, me first instinct. They're like an underground enemy cell that's infiltrated our defences, set among the parts of our body. Corrupting our whole body, setting the whole course of life on fire. Every area of our life is affected by harsh, selfish words. And what we say has a lasting impact 
on our life and on the lives of others. I think we can all recognise that when we, we see it in others. So on the, the large scale, the, the hate-filled rhetoric of Hitler corrupted a nation. And on the personal scale, there's that man who, who can't bring himself to go see his dying brother because of bitter words said decades ago. Or there's the friend whose marriage was broken apart by the drip, drip, drip of critical words. But if you're anything like me, I think we come to this kind of passage and we're thinking, look, James, you're just being a little bit over the top. Sure, we say nasty things, but evil, out of control. I don't think I have that much trouble with my words. I don't let things get that far. But what standard are we uh, applying? Would we be comfortable if every word that we said this week or every word that we thought in our heads had been recorded and was played out loud in front of all the people that we know? I know I wouldn't be comfortable with that. This passage asks us a, a searching question. If we're troubled by harsh, unforgiving words, if we hate the hate that we see in the world, can we admit that we find that same hate on our own tongues? That we share responsibility for that problem? If we can, I think our, our first reaction might be like the advice that I found on one entrepreneur's website recently. After describing all the ways that what you say can benefit you or harm you in business, this is how he finishes the article. Think before you speak next time. Just control yourself. Now, some of us will have the willpower to hold our tongue at bay better than others, at least for a little bit of time. But have a look at verse 7 and 8. All kinds of animals have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. We can bend creation and its creatures to our will, but none of us can tame our own tongues. They're a restless evil. Words just break out. As one preacher put it, we're like the, the man coming out of Starbucks, loaded up with coffees for the office. We might feel calm and in control, but just one nudge in our soft spot. And everything will spill out in a hot, boiling mess. We can't control our speech. Can we admit that? But if we do admit that, that still leaves some big questions, especially if we're Christians. Why does so much evil come out of our mouths when we're following Jesus? What does that say about our faith? In verses 9 to 12, James applies everything he said to Christians in particular. And he identifies the cause of our tongue trouble. We have divided hearts. Because James is most concerned that for believers, the kind of speech he's talking about is just totally inconsistent. Verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. We praise God, tell him we trust him. That's what we've just been doing this morning in our, our songs and in our prayers. But we also say hurtful, divisive things to others. And when James says curses, he, he just means all of those bad words, and in chapter 1, 19, it's angry words. In chapter 4, it's slander and quarrels. And here's the problem. It's not just that we're using our words in two contradictory ways. It's that we're relating to God in two contradictory ways. Because our mouths big God up and pull others who are made in God's likeness down. So every day I, I tell my family that I love them. I speak proudly of them to others. But, but can you imagine if while my family were out of the park one day, I went around the house and I got, I got some family photos like, like this one here. And I started ranting and swearing at the people in the photo. If I started criticising each person's flaws, bringing back up everything that they'd ever said that had offended me. What would that tell you about 
my relationship with my family. At best, I think you could say that I had deeply conflicted feelings about them. But at worst, I think you'd say that, that deep down, all of the words that I said face to face were a kind of mask. But really, I don't love and enjoy my family. And that's what's going on when Christians praise God but lash out at other human beings made in his likeness. The inconsistent use of our tongue reveals that we're really in two minds about God. That's why verse 10 is so urgent. My brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. A pattern of inconsistent words reveals that we have divided, inconsistent hearts. We're double-minded in the words of James. We're, we're torn between enjoying God's mercy and setting ourselves up as judge. Between trusting that God's in control and, and grasping for control ourselves. And verse 11 and 12 shows us that we can't produce divided words indefinitely. Because we can't have a divided heart indefinitely. At some point, we'll prove to be one thing or the other. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? No. Trees only produce fruit that matches their kind. In the end, James says, each tree is recognised by its own fruit. To, to quote Jesus, each tree is recognised by its own fruit. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A divided, double-minded heart, if it's not addressed and changed, will finally turn out to be an anti-God heart. A salt spring cannot produce fresh water. If we reach the end of our life and our words are salty towards others and towards God, it's because we'll have turned out to be salty at source. We'll have wandered away from the wholehearted faith that, that saves. And we'll have lost out on eternal life. But James doesn't want to leave us despairing. He's called us to purify our hearts in, in the words of chapter 4, verse 8, um, to mature into the all the way through faith. But if we want a purified heart and the increasingly controlled speech that, that it'll produce, then we need to look for change in the right place. We need to turn to the tongue tamer and find change through God's mercy. That's our final point. Because James says that anyone never at fault in what they say, is perfect, literally a perfect man. And Jesus was and is the all the way through perfect man. His life shows he wholeheartedly trusted his father. And so he was totally in control of his words. His friend Peter said no deceit was found on his mouth. And he willingly went to his death to take the judgment for our divided heart, to take the judgment for our uncontrolled words, and to give us the reward of his righteousness, so that from God's perspective, it's like we had Jesus's undivided heart, like we'd spoken his controlled, consistent words. That's the mercy of God. And it's available for anyone who'll accept it. And when we do accept it, God renews our hearts. His son's spirit uses the words of truth to make us more like that perfect man. No human being can tame the tongue. But God can. Maybe you've never taken that personal step of trusting the merciful God. 
But as you reflect on your life, you, you know that you can't control your tongue. You know that you've said things that you regret, that you've hurt people, that you've damaged relationships. If that's you, ask for God's mercy. Ask Jesus, the perfect man, to give you all the benefits of his perfect, undivided heart, all the benefits of his perfect, pure speech. Mercy triumphs over judgment, and God loves to save. And if we're believers, but we recognise that our words are inconsistent, that at least at some level our hearts are divided, then let's turn again to the tongue-taming God. Let's keep massaging the truth of God's mercy into our hearts until they mend. Now, what might that, that look like? Well, maybe there's someone in our life who we regularly find ourselves criticising, uh, perhaps because our, our divided hearts are shaky about the fact that we needed mercy. We keep forgetting that, and so we, we assume that position of judge over others. Well, why not get into the habit of daily confessing your own evil words, your own sins of the tongue? Start training our hearts to, to love the mercy that we've received because of Jesus. So that when we do next see that person's fault, or when they next say something to us uh, that we really don't like, we'll remember our own need for mercy. We'll see in their faults a reflection of our faults. And we'll be able to, to let it go without comment. And if we do catch ourselves starting to form angry words, or if we come out of a conversation and we realise that we use some of them, well, let's start to speak back to our hearts some of the, the truths about God's mercy that we've seen here. So we could say, Joe, look, you've received so much mercy that the perfect man had to die for you. Surely you could let that one go. Because as we keep applying God's words of truth to our divided hearts, the God of mercy will start to mend those hearts and he will start to tame our tongue. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we admit that our uncontrolled words so often harm others and that those words come from a, a divided heart. So please forgive us through your Son, the perfect man, and purify our hearts by the, the work of your Spirit through your word so that our words might increasingly be full of that mercy and love that reflects you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
as we come to the end of our time together, please do continue to use the chat facility to say hi to someone. And also, it would be great if you are able to join us on Zoom once this service is over. Just click the link in the chat bar and we will see you shortly. So this week, all the normal weekly activities are carrying on as usual. But there is one very important notice that I would like you to put in your diary. And that is our church picnic. So next Sunday, 26th of July at 12.30pm, we are all going to gather at Wormwood Scrap for a church picnic. It's going to be a great opportunity to say hello to ourselves, um, especially after having been separated for so long. Um, but also, sadly, it's going to be an opportunity to say goodbye to Joe and Zani, who have been with us since last year. And now is the time for them to continue elsewhere for their church placement. So this is a wonderful time for us to say goodbye to them and also to their wonderful children, Florence, Eliza, and Jonathan. An email is going to be sent with MAP to help you locate the place where we are having this picnic. As we end our service, shall we share the grace together? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and evermore. Amen.